now where just now the, those participants were having stage fright. I'm very overwhelmed right now just looking at all of you. Um, um, very good morning everybody. My name is Denise and I'm a technical with officer with at Wetlands International Malaysia. So first of all I would like to say thank you very much to the organizers for inviting us to be your client for the uh, poster design 2019 and secondly <coughs> I would like to thank all of you participants because I know that you will come up with really fantastic uh, work to help us <coughs> promote and advocate for our work and uh, yeah so without further ado let's begin when we talk about conservation in Malaysia, oops, sorry, my title for the day, Wetlands, Nature's Hidden Treasures. Um, yeah, I'm just here to tell the story about wetlands because I believe not many people know about wetlands, what they are, what they do, why are they important. <coughs> so when we talk about conservation efforts in Malaysia, This is what you think of. Oh, cute animals, panda, tigers, elephants, shark. Very cute to some people. But when I tell people that I work in wetlands conservation, I always get two responses. One is, oh cool. Second one is, huh? <laughs> wetlands? Because the general perception of wetlands is that they are wastelands. So every time I tell my relatives, yeah, I work in wetland conservation, huh, you go into swamp, ah. and then how? A long mosquito. <laughs> the, yes, that happens, but it depends on which type of wetlands you go into. And say, what about, you know, all the dangerous like, what river la, water la, and all, you get stuck in the mud. That has happened to me many times before. I always get stuck because I'm very clumsy. So I'm the, always the first one in the field to fall over, trip over something, get bitten by mosquitoes, scratches, everything. And then, of course, there's the conception, wetlands are swamps. So what do you think of crocodiles? That doesn't really happen. Occasionally, you do see them, but like any other wildlife in general, they will not attack you unless they feel threatened by you. Okay. <coughs> and the most interesting one is when they say, God, can you both come and capture you or not? <laughs> no, 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 in Malaysia, no. No cannibalism here. Okay, so all these perceptions, misconceptions about wetlands is simply because people do not know much about them. People do not understand them. So, true but not true. Eh? <coughs> so, just a little background information about Wetlands International. We are the only global non-for-profit organization that works to maintain and restore wetlands. First, for their environmental <coughs> values and the services that they provide to people. But more than that, the intrinsic value that wetlands themselves hold. So we were formed in 1996 and we have a network of offices around the world, 20 I counted this morning. So because wetlands are not known ecosystems, they are usually the first to go. When it comes to you need land for uh, conversion and agriculture, wetlands are the, always the first one on the list. So we are very concerned about how, how quickly we lose our wetlands. And we know that wetlands are actually very vital to human well-being, the role they play in climate change, you know, um, water security, biodiversity, which I will talk a little bit more about later on in the slide. So that is why our mission and our, our vision, where we are, we are in a world, we live in a world where wetlands are treasured, and nurtured for their beauty, the life they support, and resources they provide. And our mission, of course, is to sustain and restore wetlands. So, a little bit about the work that we do. Oh, sorry, our offices. Yeah, that's my nation. Okay. 
in our sister office in Brunei and we do a lot of work together with our Indonesia office. And our HQ is actually in the Netherlands. So what we do, at Wetlands International, we are focused on three things. One is scientific knowledge, two, practices on the ground, and third, policy. So why, or rather, the, what, how we work is, we work with a lot of researchers. So we have a lot of scientific study about wetlands, and we use that to drive practices and policies, because you have proof. So you can then say, you know, this is what we know and this is how we should go about based on what we know rather than just plucking figures out from the air or, you know, coming up with uh, random comments or statements. So everything that we say has scientific <coughs> proof and that is why we are very credible and we, have tr we are a trusted source. And the other advantage that we have at Wellens International is because we are uh, in many countries so we have a lot of offices, then we can work together with other offices or our other networks, partner networks, and pull our knowledge and resources together. So when we do this, we actually can create a greater impact on the work that we do. But this is very wordy, and I usually don't like a lot of words in my presentations, so I put a lot of photos in. What we do on a day-to-day -day basis, Field surveys. So this is our expert, our biodiversity expert going for field survey. And wetlands are mostly water. So we work in inundated conditions. He's going for a dragonfly survey. This is back then we were doing a survey on pit fishes. And sometimes you get a little bit too deep in the water. So the concept that the idea that you researchers get stuck in mud or whatever, it does happen. And then, of course, you do your, your biodiversity survey to get your baseline data. And then from there, you also have to do monitoring activities. Because first, you need to know what you have. And then you need to know what you want to do. And then the steps that you're taking to achieve it and also whether you're still on track to meet your goals or not. So monitoring is very important for us. Uh, so next, we have stakeholder engagement. Because we're an NGO, we are the bridge between governments, corporate sectors, and uh, local communities, and also the general public, like yourself. And that's why we believe very much in stakeholder engagement. Because, like just now, during the previous um, session when Natalie was in one, scenario, one situation, you can have so many different types of reaction. It's exactly the same when it comes to wetland management. The government wants this, the local community wants that, NGOs want this, everybody wants different things. So stakeholder engagement gives us the opportunity to meet with these people, understand what they want, what they need, and we try to find a way where it is win-win for everybody. And the best part about stakeholder engagement for me on a personal level is that I get to meet with the community and I learn their ways, I learn their culture, I learn what's important to them. Then, of course, we also conduct capacity building activities for the government and for the local community. <coughs> And we also run awareness talks. And everybody's favorite activity when it comes to conservation work, replanting activities. Just, just curious, has anybody attended a replanting activity before? Not many, uh, I don't really see that many show of hands. But yeah, replanting activity is one of the things that many of you can actually do uh, to help with environmental restoration. Replanting activities. <coughs> My PowerPoint just went out. Sorry, technical issue. <coughs> uh -huh. And 
last but not least, we do produce a lot of publication. But that's pretty much what we do. Now the next, this is the important part. What are wet bands? This is what I would like to share with you all. According to the Ramsar Convention, which is like the mother who takes care of wetlands, it defines wetlands as areas of marsh, fern, peatland, or water, la 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 la. Very long definition. Even I worked so long with Wetlands International, so I still don't remember the definition. So I came up with a simpler way to understand what our wetlands, which is basically land that is covered with water. They can be seasonal, they can be permanent. So this is a permanent lake that you will find in most tropical countries like Malaysia. But if you go to more temperate countries where they have four seasons, then you may find that some of their wetlands are actually seasonal. So in Malaysia, we have 31 <coughs> wetland types, which is roughly divided into Green is out again. <laughs> which is divided into marine and coastal zone wetlands. Uh, common examples would be your mangroves, which, have, except for those who have done replanting activities, have any of you been to a mangrove forest? Yes. Good. And then uh, coral reefs. So these two are the faces of coastal wetlands. And then we have. Uh, Inland wetlands or freshwater wetlands. So common ones would be, like I mentioned earlier, peatlands and also rivers. And last but not least, we have our man-made wetlands. Back there. Sorry. Okay. Our man-made wetlands, which actually have quite a few reservoirs. So this is Arctic Kenya, uh, your reservoir and also paddy fields. So if you all have been to Sakinchan, you've basically also visited a man-made wetland. And of course, urban wetlands, which are your like uh, golf courses and the ponds that you have, the lakes around your house where you, you sometimes go for recreational activities. Yeah, those are urban wetlands. So, wetland ecosystem services. Why are wetlands important? <coughs> There are so many benefits and functions that wetlands provide to us and it's so much so that you know it's difficult to just clump all into one. So wetland scientists and researchers have actually divided it into four different types of uh, functions. The first one is provisioning. So this one is very important to us. It's important because when we talk about provisioning, we basically talk about food and fresh water. They provide us with food and fresh water. So this <coughs> is not limited to only cost, coastal communities or people who live around wetlands, but the food that we get, the fish that we get, <coughs> they all come from our wetlands. And then of course, for the coastal community or communities living around wetland areas, natural resources. For example, they get um, fuel, they use wood, they get fuel, uh, they also use it for charcoal production. So if you guys like barbecue, this is where you get your aram from. Lah. And then of course, there are a lot of wetland plants that we, they will harvest and they will use to uh, weave and make into things that they will use around the house. And of course, for us, it's pretty unusual. But for communities living around wetlands, sometimes getting turtles or whatnot is an extra source of protein for them. So it's their food. And of course, there are a lot of livelihood opportunities for them when it comes to a wetlands because they use it for transport. But nowadays, they, you know the term ecotourism is also become very popular. So it's another source of income for them, for the communities living around wetlands. Okay. The next a uh, benefit of wetland is their regulating services. So things like climate regulating, flood regulation, water purification and whatnot. This is just a very simple diagram that will show you 
wetlands are known as uh, kidneys because first of all they will have a lot of wetland plants that grow along the edges of the uh, wetland so when it rains and water runs through these plants will actually act as a filter so they will stop sediments from going in you know they will slow the water that is entering the area and then they also act as sponges so what happens is when you have a river this is your river the parts at the side around here are known as your flood plains. So it goes down, the water goes down this way, and then it opens up into a bigger wetland area. And what happens is the water will then slowly trickle down into the ground. So that actually also goes into your groundwater storage. Yeah. And then of course if your wetlands are located along the coastlines, then they act as a <coughs> protective barrier against uh, soil erosion and also more importantly they absorb wave energy then uh, supporting functions so for me this picture actually shows a lot about what wetlands do first of all you will have you see many species of birds mammals reptiles amphibians whatnot so this is the habitat for a lot of animals and on top of that, it's, a, it's very diverse. You might think that wetlands are at very um, dull areas because of the conditions but actually they support a lot of life there. And you see these roots here, <coughs> what happens is they help in soil formation. So every time when the waves come in and they break, they will bring in they will remove sediment and bring in sediment, you know, it's a non-stop process of push and pull. So eventually over time, the soil will build up around this area and more trees will grow further on and extend towards the sea. way to to see what is happening is that wetlands are wet areas and then they have to sort so usually it's inundated and then when things when the leaves die they drop into the soil they don't decompose okay so that's why they are important for carbon sequestration and storage and I mentioned earlier soil formation primary production and nutrient cycling so Earlier I mentioned also that it's important for what, as a wildlife habitat and spawning ground or nursery for a lot of the fishes and yeah. And I think probably this part is the part that is most relevant to us or maybe what we can relate to because wetlands are where a lot of cultures take place. So this is uh, the Mark Mary community at Kerry Island is very near to us, Kerry Island. Uh, this is when they are celebrating Hari Moyang. And then this is taken from the wetlands in Johor, Kampung Dinding. And what they do is, is they have a competition where they try to get that little sticks at the top there. But the thing is, this pole is lined with grease. So it's actually very difficult to do so. But yeah. And then, it's a very good place for education. We learn a lot about wetlands, our ecosystem, how things interact in nature. Uh, so, and also, this is where, you know, if you carry out wetland education <coughs> activities, people learn more about nature. And not only that, you also learn about how our actions will impact nature. So, yeah. And of course, wetlands are a spot for recreation, recreational activities like you can go for mangrove boat, boat ride or if you are a birder, this is where you will always want to hang out. This is where birders will go and they will spend all their day with their telescope looking for birds. And last but not least, 
because we do not study a lot about wetlands, we lose our wetlands faster than we can the time and opportunities to study them. That there is so much we don't know about our wetlands. So it's a very fantastic place for scientific research. There are so many species in the wetlands that we have not discovered, but we lose them already. We've already lost them. And on top of that, the many other benefits that we get from wetlands, we still don't know about this because we've lost them. So it's a good place to do science. And whatever knowledge that we have about wetlands right now, we barely scratch the surface. And of course, for me, the best part about wetlands is that is where you have a lot of fun. Have you all done this before? Yes. Yeah? Yeah. So that's the best part about going for... That's why I say I like engaging with the community because they show you all these kind of things and you experience these kind of things that for many of us living in the city, we don't do this anymore. So I think that, you know, it's a good way for people to connect back to nature. But of course, the sad reality today is that wetlands are facing a lot of degradation and we are losing our wetlands. So the main causes of wetland degradation and loss, wetlands need water. Okay? So if you drain your wetlands, if you alter their hydrological regime, this is what you get. Okay? Degraded forests. And then, why we lose our wetlands, I mentioned earlier, because they are not important. We don't know about them, so they are not important. We can use the land for agriculture. We can use the land for shrimp farming. And what happens after the land is no longer fertile? We build houses. We build houses on our wetlands. This all used to be wetland area. But due to, because population of population growth, we need more houses, or because people want a holiday home along the coast, we've developed our wetlands. And of course, last but not least, this one, pollution. See, wetlands, a lot of trash goes into the wetlands because they come from our rivers, the rivers lead to the sea, and in between the river and the sea are your wetlands. That's where your trash, trash gets stuck. And then, of course, if you have wetlands around the uh, important shipping routes, sometimes you get a lot of oil spill, or when the ships are cleaning out their ballast, then this is actually, I'm not sure if you can see, but the black soil there, that's actually ash that comes from the ships. It's not natural soil for wetlands. So, what happens when we lose our wetlands? What are the implications? For us, cause, uh, who are living in the city, we might not feel it so much. But, when you go from healthy peat swamp forest, lots of water, to degraded peatlands, they are very susceptible to fire because, as I mentioned <coughs> earlier, peatlands have a lot, hold a lot of organic material. And this organic material is few. So, anybody who walks past you know, you strike a match, you light a cigarette and you toss it without putting it out, there goes your peatlands. And the thing about peat fire is that they burn something. You might not see it on the surface, but they actually burn underground. So when you look on the surface and you think that you've put the fire out, actually it's still burning. And then what happens after that? We get hay season in Malaysia. Hot season, rainy season, hay season. So every time we get haze and we hear the government say that that's from Indonesia, that is not true because we also have a lot of peatlands and we have been draining our peatlands. And this is what happens. Mangrove degradation. When we lose our mangroves, I'm not sure if you guys are around in 2004, but because you're very young. Most of you are very young. So we had the major tsunami that occurred. So if the mangroves were there, they would have acted as a protective barrier. They would have helped to reduce the wave energy and the impact would not have been so big. And then of course, just now wetlands act as sponge. When you remove your sponge, your water just flows through and this is what you get, flooding. Flooding coastal wetlands, flooding in the, in the city, 
because we used to have a lot of flood plains, but now KL is a concrete jungle. We've lost our wetlands, they've lost their function as a sponge. This is what we get when we have heavy rain. And of course, wetlands also help to purify, uh, excess nutrients in the water. But when you lose your wetlands, you lose those functions. Eventually, you know, you will have eutrophication, you will have pollution. And what is the implication of this? If you lose your wetlands, like I said earlier, there are nurseries for a lot of fishes. You lose your wetlands, the fish have nowhere to, to spawn. How does it affect us? Eventually, it come, becomes a food security issue because we have no fish. Just the same as when we have no water, we cannot grow our rice. So, food security is a very big issue if we continue to lose our wetlands. Have you experienced this? This happened like last year only. Yeah, it was very difficult, isn't it, not having water? Because we are so used to having water, you just turn on the tap and you get clean water. But for a lot of people, this is a luxury. I mean, having clean water directly available to us is a luxury. So these are the things that would happen if you lose your wetlands. And of course, all this leads to climate change. Climate change is the buzzword. But I think a lot of things, we still don't understand a lot about climate change. So. What can we do to help conserve and protect our wetlands? <coughs> Save water. Wetlands is water. I cannot stress enough how much wetlands is water. So every time you do something, before you think you do something, think of the consequences of your action. Uh, saving water. By say reducing our use of water, you will be reducing our reliance on the natural resources, the stress on the our natural environment. And then of course, if you see something that's not right, illegal dumping, open burning or whatever, it's good to make a report. Uh, and then, you know, in school we always learn about the three R's, reduce, reuse and recycle, and then now they have the five R's, and then eventually it became the seven R's. Those are very important things that we can do. It may be very, very small actions, but small actions can lead to big changes. Okay, and if you're interested, if you're an outdoor person, you'd like to know more about wetlands, you can always join a, a, an organization or, a, you know, a, a, yeah, an organization that will have, they usually will take in volunteers and you can actually do more work on wetlands. And of course, this, I think, is important that we should talk about it. Talk about it to your family, your friends, you know, and you talk about it, you want to learn more about it, you want to understand it, and I think that's a good way to spread the word. So, let me just share a very, very quick uh, experience, my experience. I've worked with Wetlands International for eight years already. And in the beginning, it was very difficult because I told you I'm clumsy. I always fall down, I always get stuck in the mud. I cannot keep up with the forest rangers, they're like so far ahead, I'm still behind, you know, tiptoeing my way, like, oh, I don't want to fall in there, I don't want to fall in there. <coughs> and after going into the wetlands a few times, I find that for me, on a personal level, it's a place where it gives you a sense of tranquility, a sense of calm. Because you go into the wetlands during different times, you go in the morning, it's so noisy, ch -ch 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 -ch, all the birds and all, or you hear the monkeys and whatnot. But when you go in the afternoon, you hear nothing. You are with yourself and your thoughts. It's like just so quiet and peaceful. And of course, this landscape, maybe it might be quite monotonous, it's very boring. But sometimes it surprises you when you least expect it. I don't know if you can see this or not. It's a crocodile. <laughs> we, were just, we were just on a boat on the river, going back after a few work, and I was like, oh. I wanted to stand up and take a photo, but the boatman was like, don't stand up. If you topple the boat over, with that in the water, mm, okay, okay, I'll sit down. So that was the best I could do. Maybe you all, with your Photoshop skills, you can help me make it a better photo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> so there is beauty in wetlands, but you need to look beyond the surface. It is not in your face, you know. The beauty you find in wetlands are small wonders. <coughs> or this. This is a dragonfly. It's called Nanophaya pygmaea because it's so big and it is found in our pitstone forest but only one pitstone forest, the one in Johor and just to give you an idea of scale there's my friend and there's the little fella there I don't think you can even see it yeah, or like this song toad over here oh, sorry but so small you're just like, oh yeah and wetlands are filled with hidden wonders like, you never expect a tree in a hole to have this, a monitor lizard. Or even in the mud. For you, when you look on the screen, you might just see mud. But if you look closely, can you all actually see the pointer? Ah? There is a mud skipper here. There is a crab here. And there are some uh, longtong somewhere hidden around here. Are there? hidden around here, but these are the things that you don't see. You have to search for them. And of course, there are also very, very fleeting moments of wonder for wet tents. Like when I went to the field, a night job, it was just right in the middle of the path, but the moment it saw me, we snapped the photo, it flew off. Or the mongoose, we were just driving, driving back after a field trip, and this little photo just popped out on the road. <coughs> Long enough for me to take a few photos of it, and then it ran off back right into the bush already. So it's like very split second. You see things like this, and it's like so amazing. But of course, these little wonders, if we do not act to protect them, they will be lost forever. And for me, I am very lucky because I work in this field. I get to experience it. I get to see this. But I also hope that someday all of you will be able to see things like this or experience things like this. And we really need to do something about our wetlands, especially in Malaysia. So, I guess what we would like to see in our poster is that, you know, you can help us to convey the message about why wetlands are important, you know, and what happens if we lose our wetlands. Then, of course, again, our stupid statement, our creativity, I'm sure you all are creative people here. Just, but what, we are, what I mean by creativity is that um, I would like it to be, if you can, thought-provoking, something that when people see, it stops them in their steps, and they're like, oh, I didn't know that, you know? something that will make them wow, okay? And of course, recyclable, because we have been singing this song about wetlands for over 20 years. But not many people know the lyrics yet. So this, we hope that it is something that we can use over and over and over again, because it will be something that is relevant. Especially now that with you know, the impacts of climate change, it will be even more relevant. So we hope that the poster will be something that is not a one-off kind of thing. And yeah, what we hope to achieve from the posters is of course, we would like to change the general perception that people have about wetlands and that we will foster greater awareness on the importance of wetlands and, I don't know, inspire people to take action not just the government, but also people like yourself. And uh, of course, the last one is a very, very um, ambitious, but like I said earlier, our actions will affect whether we like it or not. What happens to the people around us, but also what happens to our environment. So if we can ignite that, that change, that spark, that change, where you want to make a lifestyle change, maybe you want to be more sustainable, you want to, um, I don't know, do more recycling or spend less on shopping, you know, not, not so, then that is, I feel that's already a step forward for us. Yeah.
So my last like take home message is wetlands are some of the most diverse and productive ecosystems in the world, but very underappreciated. And uh, we still have a lot to learn about wetlands. And wetland scientists and researchers have actually said that 90% of climate impacts are water related. And I have been saying wetlands are water. So that is the direction we should look at. And of course the challenge for you guys in, this, in designing the poster is how do we put the wetlands into the mind of people so that you know more people will know about it, more people will want to take action and help protect it. So it is not too late to take action. And uh, I think that's it for me. Thank you very much. So I like this very much. I hope that you know, we get something like this, maybe an idea. Thank you so much for all the time.